How about now? Can you hear me now? No, we no can hear. How about now? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, do you guys, <laughs> thank you. So any questions? So any questions? So this is, I've uploaded this, uh, lecture presentation. Um, we had, um, last week attended a funeral for my sister-in-law. Um, and so I uh, had asked you guys to watch the Norton video instead. Uh, this is the essentially the same content. Um, so yes, there's a question about the presentation. And I'll get to that in just a second. But the short answer is yes, you have to have your presentation prepared and example calculations. So each team, um, I'll, I'll send out details later, but um, we'll probably have five teams present. Um, so each team will get about 15 minutes. So I expect about like 10 slides. Uh, and the reason is, the, the reason we're doing this is, is one of the ways we learn as engineers is by reviewing other people's design. It's not, um, it's not to see how little you know, but it's to help see where you are um, so that uh, we can help get there. So it'll probably be done on uh, Google Meet. Uh, so you'll need to make sure that your webcam is working and that you can present your screen and all that stuff. But I'll make sure that I send out some uh, uh, detailed information. Uh, so last week I'm hoping that you are able to watch the video. I had promised to upload uh, a different video. Um, I didn't get around to it because uh, we were pretty busy making arrangements. And so I asked you to watch the Norton video, which is pretty good, but there is uh, a mistake in the derivation in that video. It's corrected in the sixth version of the book. Uh, this is the presentation from last uh, Wednesday. Okay, and we'll go over some of this stuff today. But what I want to draw your attention to um, is, and we'll go, we'll go, like I said, we'll go over some of this stuff today. This equation here, um, he has one half. Uh, e times epsilon, which is Young's modulus. If he did that, that would be epsilon squared. Um, so this is the correct uh, version, and I've prepared my own lecture content to help you guys, and I summarized the derivations and added my own notes uh, to try to help make that content a little bit uh, easier and derive those uh, failure theories. So uh, hopefully you watched the video for the ductile uh, failure theories. If not, you can use uh, my slides, and you can also go through the Norton video. Uh, we're going to move on to keep schedule, and because we lost a day, um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to uh, the uh, brittle failure material, and some of the stuff I'll review so that you have that as well. Um, so are there any questions about that? <clears throat> All right. So uh, some announcements. So the test. So um, I'm going to pull up the uh, test solutions here and just to kind of walk you through it. Um, this is pretty much what I expected. These problems, this was directly from the slides, so that was a giveaway. Uh, this is just, hey, do you understand how to use a stress strain diagram, which was also pretty much a giveaway. I think almost everybody got that. And then this was also exactly like the homework, and you should have got that if it was acrylic, that with the, that stress, that, that material would fail. So it's just straightforward uh, application of Moore's circle. <clears throat> okay, and then for this test, really, this is your first machine. And so the problem with design is 
in order to learn it, you have to do it. And uh, working problems is is important, but you really don't know what you don't know until you sit down and you have to uh, solve a problem. So the intent of this problem was really not to frustrate you, but to actually help you to see kind of what you know and what you don't know. Do you know how to calculate the section modulus of a material? Do you know how to look up the values? Do you understand the relationship and the deflection? It's, you know, it's very different than just like taking an example out of the book. So this is probably one of the simplest examples that I could have picked, where essentially all you're doing is uh, cantilever beam deflection, and you can look up the tables, and there's lots of different resources for you to check your answers. Uh, I also gave you, I guess, 24 hours plus six hours. So I gave you about 30 hours to do the test. Uh, I did ask for some feedback. We'll look at those survey results uh, here in just a second. If you haven't had a chance, check your email. I sent a link. I'm going to try to take your feedback and um, make the next test uh, reflect the things that I could do better uh, to make it a little bit more straightforward or to take any criticism that you have and try to address it. Uh, the other side is that... Um, you know, like I said, to do design, you have to do design. Uh, and these are this is a pretty well-defined problem, and this is about, like, what you would be able to get uh, and a lot of problems that you'd have to solve. And then you pretty much just have to use your tools, use the books that you know, and, and try to put it all together and then build confidence. So I was really, really happy with um, some of the um, stuff that uh, – with the work that you guys did. Um, I think some of you guys just did a fantastic job. Um, in fact, most of the class did pretty well. I think the average was um, generously high. Um, and I, I hope that you had enough time. I, I tried to design the test where you had enough time to do it on your own. And hopefully not you know, enough time for you to go pay somebody on Chegg to solve it, but for you to really do it. And I, I promise you this, that we do monitor Chegg, and if we find questions like this out here, um, you know, we will address, we'll address that. But um, so I, I guess when, when can you meet with me? I have office hours. Apparently that link is not working, so I'll update that link. I'll, um, let me finish this real quick. So. We have uh, the test. The problem was, you know, if, as you roll a cart across this beam, you know, measure the output from a dial indicator. It actually has a digital output uh, that you can um, that you can read into a computer, and you can actually just measure the max deflection as it goes across, <clears throat> and then convert that to load. That way, you know, if somebody's shorting. I actually have a friend who owns a coffee shop in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, he'll get bags that. Uh, are, are a few pounds less than what they say on the outside. Um, so the idea was you basically just make some assumptions about the size, you have your base weight of the cart, you have your max weight of the cart, and you really are trying to pick a beam that has the deflection that has the same uh, range as the Minotoyo uh, dial indicator. And so what you do is you just set up your loading diagram and there's um, tables uh, for various loading conditions, there's some in the back of the book. There's tons more out there that you can find uh, in reference book, and that can help you set up your shear, I mean your load, shear, and moment uh, equations. And then you just uh, will do those for each section from where the first wheel is applied to where the second wheel is applied all the way to the reaction. Once you get those equations, then you can calculate the deflection. Uh, apply your boundary conditions, and then uh, relate that to the beam uh, deflection. So you should have got some expression like this. If you kept track of your algebra, uh, you should be able to put that in a spreadsheet and get values that are realistic. So you should get like about you know half an inch uh, deflection um, here. This is actually too much deflection with the beam that was designed with with the this value here is actually larger than the range, okay? But if you did all that, I didn't take, uh, uh, you shouldn't have lost any points. All right, so that's the test, um, and I'm going to
pull up your survey results and so I asked you to give me some feedback so I posted a quiz today to get a class pulse I just kind of want to let you guys know uh, how you are with everybody else there's no names on here so 45 44 of uh, 56 of you took it uh, most people spent uh, between four and six hours now whether or not they were watching Netflix or on their phone or what they're doing it's hard to know but that is an, an estimate of the effort so um, my hope was that if you did the homework yourself and you understood the homework that the test would be kind of right in this range okay so it seems like a little bit over half the class that's responded so far um, has done it no one finished it in less than two hours I know that you had to digest the information in order to design to solve the problem uh, and then we had about um, <clears throat> a little over a third of the class um, or, or 21 out of the I think there's 52 students 53 students so and still in the class yeah um, spent at least six hours so um, if it took you less than six hours or it took you about six hours to solve and design an entire machine I think you should be pretty happy with yourself um, and I see that most of you guys spent the time on number four well as I expected the other three problems were kind of just um, free problems um, really so um, the other thing I want to know is like how's your team getting along how well are you doing in the project uh, it sounds like about 55% uh, percent of you guys are doing well um, and then we have about 10% that are not doing well and have some problems communicating 27% uh, that seem hopeful uh, you gotta love the hopeful and then 10% that are lost okay um, so I think what we might do uh, is just so for those of you that are lost, uh, maybe try to send me an email. I know I've been responding to email. Uh, and um, if there's any specific questions, let me know. I will randomly pick between the teams on Monday to present. And you'll have 15 minutes to pretty much go through your design process. Okay, it's not rocket science. You just have to move a hunk of metal 180 degrees in a certain amount of time. So I've uploaded the servo profiles. I know that we haven't gotten into the gears and we haven't gotten into the things. We just want basic sizes, basic geometry, basic structure. And then we just will review the design. And then um, we can, I'm sure you'll feel a lot better after we do the design review. And um, if you go to the syllabus and you look um, at where we are, as far as the grading is concerned, um, we have uh, four tests. So uh, 50 per each test, I guess, 12 and a half percent. Homework's 15 percent. You're graded on a one to five, and then we have uh, the design reviews and reports. So it's the design reviews and reports are a small portion of your grade. Okay, what I expect is you kind of go through the process. So I've, I've designed it so that you know you really should be able to get like a you know um, it, it's more of a feedback it's not a adversarial uh, thing you just kinda have to show where you are and I think when you guys see where the other students are as well you'll kinda have like oh crap or you'll feel like oh yeah we're doing pretty good or you're like ah, oh, we got work to do but that's the whole point um, I think it's it, it's the way to teach design it's the way to to learn design Okay, and so you'll see that we have the project here. We have all the way to the end of the semester to deliver it, but you really shouldn't wait. You should really be moving through those um, those timelines. If you take a look at what's expected for Monday, um, I expect you to define the problem. And really what you're doing is you're just filling out that report, that project report, and then you'll take some of those slides and put them in a presentation. Okay. So you should have your design concepts. I've already seen some teams have sent me some sketches. I like the way that they're thinking. Uh, you need to understand and 
bound the problem. Then you calculate the power, torque, gear ratio, life cycle, or whatever, and define the kinematics and the servo profile. For this case, you can pick a typical trapezoidal servo profile, and I've already uploaded a little helpful document on that. You can actually Google uh, trapezoidal uh, servo profile, but essentially you're going to have um, <clears throat> constant acceleration for a little while, and then uh, s then hold, and then uh, constant deceleration. Okay, so you can take the integral of those twice. And I also think I uploaded a, a clarification video as well. So I, I expect you guys to be able to do that. And then you just kind of look at the, the mechanism, like how far do you have to go and what amount of time. Um, and then kind of what forces are you going to expect to, to see. Um, and, and again, <clears throat> really, you just got to bound the problem bound the problem and lie out what you know and then we're just going to have a discussion about it okay and i'll send you some guidelines about the uh format i'll give you uh, my powerpoint presentation template that you can use so you don't have to think about that stuff too much you can just focus on kind of helping me understand and helping the rest of the class understand where you are so far okay um so with that said are there any other questions Um, let's go back to the survey and, and then what would your make your class experience better so one person said nothing would make the class experience better so uh, but 43 of you seem to have something to say so I'll go through and uh, let's take a look at those and report back but this is a big deal here I, I really encourage you you can't I mean if you lose one point in the class and your project is 30 percent of your grade you can't really do well and not and bomb the project so you really need to figure out how to work with other people to get some stuff done i've given you the entire semester to solve a very simple machine design problem and we'll add detail as we go through the material but for now you should have the static analysis and you should know your torques and be able to pick the sizes of your motors all right um, and then as far as the test uh, one of the questions that I didn't ask is if you guys thought the test was fair or not, and uh, maybe we'll see it down here. I do anticipate assigning a design problem for each test just because we're teaching this remotely, and you really have to go through the thought process of of doing the design, and I will not make it to where it's outside of things that we haven't covered or you haven't seen before. And I hope you guys think that that's uh, reasonable. Um, so some suggestions are you, you really need to do your homework. Uh, you know, the, uh, I've already assigned it. Uh, I've given you a schedule. Okay, so at this point in time, this is Monday, 9.28. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 9.30. It's a Wednesday. So we're not on fatigue failures. We're actually a day behind. Uh, we will still have our design review on Monday. Okay. And I'll update the schedule and send that out to with that with that date. As you see here, we have an extra day for review. <clears throat> so uh, we have a question: If the report and the design review is only five percent, but the project is thirty percent, where is the bulk of that thirty percent coming from? The bulk of the thirty percent is going to come from the report uh, and my my how I grade you on the. Uh, report okay so that'll be um, here so all you really have to do uh, is you'll you'll submit this wherever you are you'll submit this uh, with this format here okay so I tell you everything you have to have right here you can even have the same slides in your presentation. I don't care. But you need to start to generate this report now and go ahead and um, uh, start to put it in. So this, this here is, I'm going to see if you followed the basic instructions that I have here and if I can take your report and if I could go and design a uh, turntable for a die with some reasonable likelihood of success uh, based upon what you give me. So that's the 30%. Uh, 
um, the 5% is just like, are you making progress? So don't procrastinate. So we have to put some points on that so you guys don't wait till the end of the semester. Um, Tristan asked, so is this designed to show how we are turning a die and turning and moving the die back and forth? So I think if you read through uh, the deliverables, um, it'll be a little bit more clear. But essentially, yeah, it's just to, you know, can you get the profile? And from that profile, can you get the torques? And from that, the torques, can you get the size of the motor that you need? Now, uh, if you can't get the size of the motor that you need or the torque that you need, then you can get what's called a speed reducer. Okay, and a speed reducer is just a gear ratio where you have it. It's a torque multiplier that'll get you the motion that you need. But the, the constraint is the time. So you got to go 180 um, degrees in 800 milliseconds. Okay. All right. So let's get into our lecture today if there's no other questions. Oh, yeah. Also, I expect you to do Scrum. So you should have a Scrum board, and you should use it as a means to communicate with your team. Okay? So if you guys... Yeah, yeah, just fill out what you can. Like, I'm not going to grade the report. I, I want you to start the report, and I want you to start putting pictures and sketches in. It will be easier for you to do that. And I also think if you just picked your slides, like if you made your slides the same as this, you know, you'll probably have like content for these seven, you know, for these seven things. And you might have like, you know, 15, 20 slides uh, for where you are. And again, like the point is not to, you know, shine the light on you and embarrass anybody but the point is just say hey where are you where where is your thought process and you pretty much just need to be thinking through these and asking uh questions i imagine we'll waste some time loading people's presentations and going from one team to the next team uh but i think you should have at least 10 minutes you know worth of uh stuff to kind of talk about and nobody needs to get dressed up or anything like that we just got to say hey this is where we are this is what we're doing Yeah, so I hope that answers your question, Nathan. And uh, so, yeah, my expectation is you do your own work, okay? Like you can't, you know, you can't be an engineer and, um, you know, like not know how to make your way through these problems, okay? So you gotta you got to do your own work. If you need help, you got to utilize the office hours. I'll update the link. <clears throat> And uh, utilize the TA. The TA has office hours every Friday. So we have three hours every week that you should be able to uh, um, um, meet with us. <clears throat> and you have a lot of grade out there, you know, uh, and I want everybody to do well. This is not like, uh, you know, I don't claim to be an amazing like, designer. I just, uh, but I do understand the process and I want you guys to go through the process and learn the process and at least be aware of where you are and what you know and what you don't know. Excuse me, I'm getting a drink here. All right, so go over the uh, things last time. All right, so let me see if I can full screen this for you. So uh, we're still concerning ourselves with static failure, and uh, please look, um, please look through the this, the video. There's actually the the failure modes where it's it's useful. I, I summarize the stuff here as well in my own way. Uh, so um, yeah, all right. <clears throat> so this is what we're doing so far. We 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 have uh, this this is mostly a review because you've had statics and you've had mechanics and materials. Uh, what's new in this class is we do dynamic failure analysis uh, with fatigue. Um, and you may or may not have, have had much exposure to static failure analysis, so this is also a review. It's such an important subject that even if we cover it twice, um, it's how humans learn to see things uh, over and over again, and it's really important for you guys to understand these failure modes, okay? So if you want a process, this is 
this is a process that most people can follow to understand um, whether their um, design is going to fail. And as you saw from the little simple beam the machine design problem, you know that you did. You actually designed your first machine uh, on on test one, so you should be proud of yourselves. Um, you you see that. Um, if we want to know where the loads are, then we have to first find the applied forces, moments, torques, draw free, free body diagrams, find the reactions, and sum forces to zero. If you haven't already, um, it's really important for you to uh, take a look at the textbook uh, case studies, okay? We don't have time to go through it in the class, but these case studies are repeated throughout the class, okay? And this is what we're talking about for static. Sum of forces zeros is zero, sum of moments is zero. Um, and uh, for statics, we just say, oh, sorry. For, dynamic, for, for full analysis, kinematic and kinetic analysis, we say the sum of forces is equal to the mass times the acceleration in that coordinate frame, okay? for all directions in that frame. Um, for statics, this is what we've been doing so far. We say the sum of all the forces is zero. Okay, and then in this case, this is a review. Th these three cases, if you don't understand these, then you need to go back and you need to take a look at them. Okay, this is how you would actually go through the design and finding the forces in, in a machine if you were doing it on paper and you or you wanted to validate or do some back of the envelope calcs or whatever do some analysis okay this is a bike uh, a handle lever here and we go through the summing of the forces you get your free body diagrams you sum your moments you set them to zero and you get a whole bunch of simultaneous equations uh, it looks hairy but it's really just bookkeeping it's easy to make a mistake but it's also easy to get to the right solution and to make sure things make sense um, if you go through this, you'll see that uh, it's just your classical mechanical engineering from statics, okay? So you ought to be able to go through this, get your system of equations. If you get your system of, of equations, you can put it in the format AX equals B, and then that's H actually a matrix that you can solve, okay? So you can invert that matrix and solve it. That's the first case study, and these case studies are repeated throughout the book. This is the second case study, static analysis, okay, where you go through and find the reaction forces. You sum them to zero. You separate your links. You find out where the forces are. You put them in a matrix. AX equals B. You solve the matrix, okay, so you get the picture. All right, so that's this, right? We find the forces. We find... Uh, the loads and then we do our mechanics of materials where we have the four loading conditions we have axial load transverse load bending load uh torsion and transverse shear i guess that's five but uh, you basically find out what's going on in the material what are the stress distributions that's what we've been talking about so far and then you can find you can draw your stress element and then you can calculate uh, those applied stresses and the principal stresses this is where we did more circle okay so, does anybody have any questions about this? This should be like, everybody, we're all mechanical engineers. We know what we're doing. We can get all the way to right here right now. Okay. So, if you're not here, I expect, I, I encourage you to make time to take care of yourself and take care of your future and your career and go back and, and make sure you can kind of get through there. You got to be able to do chapter three. Okay. Excuse me. Um, this was the last lecture that was covered by Norton uh, because of uh, my absence um, for our family last week. Uh, I also uploaded my own slides that I showed you at the beginning of the class you can see over there. Today we're going to go over brittle material. Okay, So we use von Mises for ductile material um, and we can use the von Mises uh, criterion to get an, what's called an effective stress. Okay, so that's given a sigma x, sigma y, tau xy, um, or if we have a three-dimensional state of stress, that we can find an effective von Mises stress, which is one value that we can compare to the ultimate uh, tensile stress 
um, or other uh, yield strength of the material, something like that, the tensile yield strength of material. And then based upon the effective stress and the yield strength, we can get a safety factor as the ratio of those two. Okay. Today, uh, if we have a brittle material, we can use the coulomb more effective stress. And again, that's at one value that we're going to get from the state of stress. Uh, we use this for brittle materials, so we have to know what material we're working with, and then we have to know if it's brittle or not. And then we will use the right failure criteria. And then we find that um, the principal stresses, and then uh, we can compute a safety factor based upon the ultimate tensile strength. Okay, now notice this is the ultimate tensile strength for brittle materials because they fail in tension. This is the yield strength because it fails in, uh, this is the tensile uh, uh, yield strength, okay? This is the ultimate tensile strength, okay? So, then we have to think about if we have a crack in the material. Now, all materials have cracks. We'll talk about this in more detail later. But if you have some crack in the material or you have a stress intensity, okay, not a stress concentration, a st stress intensity, um, then you can compare the cracks, the effect of the crack on a material property called fracture toughness and determine it if it will failure. And that's, that completes your failure analysis, okay? So this, this is this lecture here. And then over here, this is the last lecture. So um, composites are a totally different animal. Um, uh, we have a question, what are the typical brittle materials that you would use for bearing a load? Uh, and are composites considered brittle? So often machine elements that are part of the structure can be cast, like machine bases. You'll see a lot of cast. Uh, cast iron or gray cast iron um, so that's a brittle material but most of the time those are loaded in uh, compression and we'll see why and they're cheaper so any other questions okay um, so when we talk about the materials we talk about uh, we, we can classify materials as an even material or an uneven material and all that means is that if we have an even material, then we get the same behavior to failure in compression and in uh, tension. Okay, so you can see that on the left, okay, where we have a tensile test, we have a compression test, and it fails at the same stress here, the same principal stress, or the same max shear this material fails at the same place in compression and in tension. It turns out that most ductile material, I mean, most even materials are tend to be ductile material. And they usually fail in shear. Okay? So the way to see that is if we have a tensile test. Okay? So we take uh, a material and we put it in axial load. So we're, we move along this principal axis. As we move along this axis, okay, we're increasing the, uh, print the um, normal stress on that face. It also happens to be the principal stress because we don't have uh, stress on the other direction. This is a plane stress situation for the axial, like for a stress strain test. So we go out here. We are also increasing the max shear in that material, okay? So the material fails where it fails, okay? This is the load we apply, and then it fails at this point. Well, it fails at this uh, normal stress. It also fails at this shear stress, okay? And we can actually, well, I'll show you in a second. We can look at the material, and we can say if it failed in shear or it failed uh, intention. Now an uneven material in contrast has different Mohr's circles between tension and compression. It turns out that these materials actually fail in tension because the tensile stress is less than the shear stress that it can withstand 
which is also less than the compressive stress that it can withstand. So uneven materials usually can have higher compressive loads. They tend to fail. Uh, they tend to be brittle materials and they tend to fail in tension. Okay, because the shear strength here is uh, greater than the um, um, than the uh, normal stress or principal stress of that material. Okay, and this is this is where they fail. So what they're doing is we're testing this. We pull it in a tension test until it fails. Pop. They put it into a compression test until it's it's smashed and shear planes come off. Okay, and then what we do is we just draw this line. Okay. Uh, which is the tangent for these test results, okay? And this is an uneven material. Um, and those tend to be brittle, okay? So the brittle materials like cast steel, like gray cast iron, machine bases, cast aluminum, centered metal, and ceramics, uh, wrought materials like wrought steel, aluminum, titanium, magnesium, and some plastics, those tend to be even materials. And we use both materials for all sorts of engineering um, applications. <clears throat> and you often have to choose which material you're going to use. All right. So you're safe if you're in the zone. You're not safe if you're outside. Okay. So stay between the red lines. These, these, these lines are your failure lines. Okay. Excuse me. Um, so we talked about this. Okay. Brittle materials fracture instead of yield. Okay, we see that in their stress drain diagram. You come up to some point, and then you come up, you increase the level, and then pop. They, uh, they'll usually it'll have a um, uh, crack that propagates across the surface. Okay, it'll fracture. So when we talk about uh, loads, I'm just this is by way of reminder. Okay, this if you have a, a stress strain test test where you just apply axial load you have your sigma 2 and sigma 3 are zero so they show up here and then you have your sigma 1 and then you can load it until you have your max shear okay now in the Mohr circle these are 90 degrees from each other right but if you remember when we derived it we actually said that that's actually 2 theta so the max shear occurs at 45 degrees from the max, uh, from the principal stress in, in reality. The Mohr circle is just a visualization of the stresses. The shear plane in real life is 45 degrees. If we have something in pure torsion uh, or pure shear, this is what it looks like, okay? So if you're twisting a bar, you're applying a max shear, okay? And what you do is you cause the principal stresses to be equal and opposite as they develop on the, those faces. All right, so this is just um, trying to give you more of a sense of how the materials are. Okay, now we have two columns of material. This is from your book. It's like chapter two, I think, whatever. Uh, I summarized them here. You have uh, mild steel, which is ductile, and then you have brittle cast iron, which is brittle, and then you have axial load. Now we have the same axial load. We have, we have the same loading type for both of these materials, but if you see the brittle material um, or the, the ductile material, it shears, okay, at 45 degrees, okay? And that's because this material is up here, and that's the limiting stress. Then you have this material, which pops on the normal plane, okay, so it fails in tension, okay? Down here, when we compress the material, it fails in shear. Now, you, if you go back and you go right here, and we see we can take higher compressive stresses than we can shear, it's going to fail in shear when we go in compression. Okay? So that's what we see. When we go into bending, the bending stress it causes a, a, a load on the cross section, and it'll pop due to, due to that uh, normal load on that uh, cross section, whereas the uh, failure here, we didn't actually get to where the material failed because it just bent, uh, bent beyond the nominal value, so we define failure as the maximum deflection. Now, in torsion, here, 
we get the opposite behavior that we get in tension, okay? So here, 45 degree shear plane, it failed in shear. Down here, it failed um, in, uh, due to uh, normal stresses. Same test, both in pure tension, and then this one, it failed um, due to um, uh, shear. So this, is, this slide, spend some time with it. I've explained it. Uh, make sure you understand the relationship between these diagrams and these brittle and, and um, ductile materials, and you'll have a very good sense of how you can use these materials and their strengths and weaknesses and limits, okay? I have some little dots here to kind of show where the max shear is or where the failure occurs, okay? Um, so, and recall that 90 degrees on Moore's circle 90 degrees here is 45 degrees here in real life. Very important. Um, so, real quick, materials fail according to their weakest strength. Okay, for ductile materials, or what we call even materials, for the most part, this is typically their shear strength. For brittle materials, it's typically their tensile strength. Uneven materials will typically fail in shear before compression. Okay, we see all that right here. Understand this. All right, so in the last lecture that uh, Norton covered for me is he went over these, uh, this and we talked about the maximum uh, shear stress theory and distortion energy theory. We also call this the von Mises theory. This is the one we use. It's the most accurate, but it's not the most conservative. So what we do is we design, we use these failure theories, and then we'll use a safety factor. Okay, now today we're talking about the brittle failure theories. And we're going to uh, talk about the modified more, I'll actually give you the other ones, but this is the most accurate. And these are statistical, okay? Um, things don't fail at the same load till you know seven significant digits every time okay there's some uh, confidence interval and there's some uncertainty and there's variation in material and so most accurate doesn't mean that we can design to this and expect we won't have failure we have to design to something less than this and then they use the safety factor all right now from the last lecture, you should recall that this is what we had. And this actually shows three ductile failure theories. This is also called uh, like the octahedral theory, but this is um, the, um, um, the von Mises uh, theory. Okay, and if you see here, this is these are failure points, okay, for 1023 steel, some nickel alloy um, and then um, I don't know I forgot what these are off the top of my head I think this yeah this is aluminum this is aluminum these are two steel alloys with different components in there so these are the failure points in real life okay and these circles all fall pretty much along the octahedral shear theory or the von Mises uh, uh, failure the failure criteria or the distortion energy uh, failure criteria they they fall here okay so it's the most accurate you'll see this dash line here this is a little bit more conservative because it says that failure is defined outside of this envelope right so these are our stresses this is sigma 1 over your max uh, strength and this is sigma 2 over your max strength for um, this material and you'll see here that gray cast iron okay which is a brittle material uh, actually follows this max normal stress uh, theory a little bit more closely than for the ductile materials so we have different failure theories because we have uneven materials and this whole square right here actually shows up right here okay and this graph here, this is our brittle failure theory, and it has uh, the Coulomb-Moore theory here, okay, which basically says that uh, you're good, you're not going to fail all the way up to your tensile strength, 
And then if you take a line from the uh, zero axis all the way down to your uh, ultimate ten, your minus compressive strength, um, then if you stay inside of that envelope, you should be good. And if you see, it kind of matches the circles that we had for the um, uneven materials. So you you would expect we'd have we'd be able to withstand higher loads when we have compressive loads. Okay, we can sustain less loads when we have tensile loads. In this case, we have uh, we define tension as positive. So this is sigma one, sigma three. They're both positive over here. One of them is negative. So we have one compressive load, one tensile load. Over here, with the other one is they swip, swap, swap signs. Okay, so you have one compressive load still and one tensile load, and then here you have both uh, compressive loads. So when you have both compressive loads, you can withstand a lot more uh, load all the way to the compressive uh, strength of the material. Okay, so the compressive strength of the material is in this box. Up here, this is the uh, tensile strength of the material. And then the question becomes, well, what do we do in between? Okay, so the Coulomb-Moore theory says, well, we just draw a line. Well, it turns out that we can actually get a little bit more accurate than that with the modified Moore theory. And the modified Moore theory just says, well, we can go all the way down to minus the ultimate tensile strength in both the uh, sigma-1 and sigma-2 axes. And then we can draw the box from here to here to here to here to here all the way to here. Okay, so that gives us this little, I don't even know what color this is, the, the darker reddish color. And that gives us a little bit more uh, area to operate in so where we're safe. Now, if you look down here, this is actually test data taken from this uh, reference here. And it shows that, well, I'll be doggone, the... Um, Modified Moore theory is pretty accurate, and it shows that the failure occurs closer to the modified Moore theory. But as you can see, all these are they're outside. They failed outside the uh, where the failure was predicted, so it's slightly conservative for that particular material at that temperature in that loading condition. Um, for gray cast iron, it follows that theory. Okay, so what we can use we can say well we can use this theory. Okay, and then we can, um, uh, for uneven materials that are brittle, and if we're inside of this envelope, then we can say we're pretty safe, but we want to know how far are we inside of the envelope. And I want to draw your attention here to this point. Okay, on this point here, you have equal and opposite uh, applied uh, loads, and that's pure torsion. Okay, so another way of thinking about this is we can go from zero to pure torsion all the way to the max compressive stress. Okay, zero, I mean, uh, ten, the ten, tension to um, minus the pure um, shear and tension all the way down to the compressive, um, minus the compressive strength of the material. Uh, this guy uses sigma c, but this is actually your strength value. So in the book, we use S for strength, and that's the material property. All right, so are you still with me? And do you have any questions? All right, so again, you're safe if you're in the inside. You fail if you're on the outside. Now turns out that uh, we can just really look at that uh, right half quadrant. Okay, so that's over here. If we look at this over here, this right half zone. Can I please answer Sam's question? Oh, I don't see Sam's question. Sam, where is your question? Oh, Sam, there we go. Do we need to design how the servo is mounted in the machine or just the turntable with an input shaft and gear ratio? Yeah, you need to do the design. Um, and you can see how most servos uh, are attached. So, um, all right. Thanks, Miriam. Any other questions? Uh, just post them, and I'll try to get to them as we go. 
Now, this is kind of a busy slide, but it's actually one of the more, most important slides of this lecture because it, it, it shows you that we have to have uh, two different cases to find our safety factors. <clears throat> okay, so in this case, um, we have two regions, okay? So if we're above this, this dot here, and this point is uh, the ultimate tensile strength and minus the ultimate tensile strength for sigma one and sigma three. So this is plain, uh, uh, plain stress. So uh, sigma um, th uh, two is zero. So um, we have this region here, and that's this region up here, okay? And so what we need to do is we need to s find out what our safety factor is. And what we do is we have what's called a load line, and this is our load line. Now it turns out if we're up here above this line that starts to taper down to our uh, compressive strength mark, if we're above this line, we can use this safety factor, okay? And that's what I've highlighted here. If you're above SUT, the ultimate tensile strength, and uh, or, I should say or, um, shoot. So I'll change this to or, strike that out. So basically, if, 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 if sigma 1 and sigma 2 are positive, okay, use this for your safety factor. Take your ultimate strength, and you can just use sigma 1 as your um, safety factor. If you're below here, you got to figure out how far you away are how far you are away to that line, and you can use this equation right here. Okay, so this is your ultimate tensile strength. This is the absolute value of your compressive strength. It just means if it's negative, don't use a negative. And then you can take your principal stresses, sigma one and sigma three, and then you can find your safety factor. And all that they're really doing is you're looking at how far away is this point B from B prime. What's the relative length of this B to B prime? Okay, so if you look up here, it looks like A, A is going to be about, have a safety factor of about 2. B is going to have a smaller safety factor because it's about 3 quarters of the way to B. And then C is going to have maybe about the same, I don't know, it's hard to tell from there. Okay, but these are your load lines. And if you're above this, you got to use this equation. If you're below that, you got to figure out where you are in this line, and you got to use this equation. And that's how we calculate the safety factor. And the safety factor is just defined on where we are in that load line relative to the boundary. What's this length here over this overall length, the B prime? Okay, that's your load line. It's that simple. If you're outside of this red dashed part, you're outside of this box, you will, uh, you, failure is likely. Okay, so let's say you don't really feel like plotting the load line, you just want to plug and chug. Well, you have that option too, thanks to Dowling, who contributed his Dowling indexes. And he basically has three values that you can calculate from your principal stresses, your tensile strengths, and compressive strengths. And then you find an effective stress. This is kind of like what we did with the von Mises criteria. You find that effective stress, and it's just the maximum of your principal stresses and your Dowling indexes. Okay, and then you can just take your ultimate tensile strength, divide it by your effective stress, and that's your safety factor. Okay, this is an example. Okay, so this shows this. Uh, rod, which we've seen before, you apply a load to this arm, which is going to put this in bending, as well as transverse shear, as well as torsion. Okay, so you're going to have three loading conditions when you apply this. You should be able to look at that, and you should be able to see them all. Now, those loading conditions don't show up all at A and B. Some show up at uh, A, others show up at B. Okay, um, and so we can calculate those, what there are. So it gives us the material properties here. It says we have a static load. 
And then the question is, if this is a brittle material, what are our safety factors? Okay, what are the safety factors based upon these loading conditions? So we do the same thing. The analysis is the same for uh, brittle or ductile materials to find our stresses. So we can find our sigma x's at point A. That's up here, point A. Point A, the stress at point A. We have bending stress and we have uh, torsion, okay? Because the torsion is here, right? And then you have your max bending stress on the outside fiber of the material, okay? So that's shown here at A. We can calculate that, MC over I. That's our flexure formula for our bending stresses. And then we have our uh, shear due to the applied torque, TRJ over J. Uh, we can use that. We'll plug it into our Mohr circle equations to get our max in plane shear and our principal stresses. And then we can use those principal stresses uh, if we know where we are. Okay. So based upon what I just said on the previous slide, we can find out where we are. Well, because A is above the uh, this point here, right? Our ultimate tensile strength. Because A is above that, then we can just use this formula right here, okay, right here. And then I can get my safety factor, which is the relative distance of A to this distance here, and it turns out that our safety factor is 2.2. So for that load, at point A, I can withstand that load with a safety factor of 2.2. Now, obviously, if I doubled the load, I'd be very close to failure. Um, Alternatively, we can use those dowling indexes, calculate them, include the principal stresses uh, right here, take this equation, find the max. Once we find the max, we use that equation, and then we can plug it into the formula for that, and it turns out we get, of course, the exact same answer. You can use this approach, or you can use the equations to find out where you are in the load line. Okay. Now, uh, for point B, for point B, we can uh, look at our transverse shear, okay, and then we can look at our torsional uh, shear, and then um, add those two together because that's the state of stress at point uh, B. Okay, we have the four through four V over three A. That's the transverse shear for a rod, and then we have the TR over J due to the applied load. Well, once we add those up. Okay, we find our principal stresses. Same thing using the Moore's uh, circle di uh, equations to find the principal stresses. And then we have to figure out where we are. Well, over here, we're at point B. Okay, so we have a different slope, but we're still above this line, so we can use the same equation. Um, no, no, you don't need to use the dowling stresses. You can just use the this equation right here. Okay. Uh, Michael asked, do you need to do the dowling? Do you need to use the dowling equations if you're up here? And the answer is no, you don't. You can just use this equation. Okay, but you do need to know where you are, right? So another way of saying it is like if you have positive, if if you're in comp if you're in tension on both surfaces, you can use this this equation um, here. Okay, which is the same one. <clears throat> So yeah, find out where you are. If you're above this line, you can use this equation right here. All right, now you can use the dowling factors, okay? And then you take the max, you find your effective stress from the dowling factors, which is just the max of these. Once you do that, uh, you find that it's 12, 8, 27, which is actually the max uh, shear here. And you're in pure shear, okay? So sigma one is gonna be equal to minus sigma three. Um, and then we can calculate the safety factor. In this case, the safety factor is 4.1. All right, so my friends, that is the modified Moore theory. I'm going back here. Okay, this we just went over was the modified Moore theory, and it's the most accurate, and that's what we use for brittle materials. So understand this example, and you'll be fine. And do the homework on your own. Don't copy, don't cheat. Now, <clears throat> the next thing we're going to talk about is fracture mechanics um, so any more questions let me know just post them down there and we'll pause okay 
Now, during World War II, they had a demand. To, they wanted to get ships out a lot faster. Historically, they were riveted, and riveting was much slower than welding, so they welded them up together, opened a bunch of ship factories, and then they had ships that were splitting in half. And they were uh, perplexed. Uh, why were ductile materials failing like uh, brittle materials because um, they were using ductile welds, okay? So we now know that this was due to uh, crack propagation, but at the time that theory didn't exist. So they started actually a committee that's uh, still in existence today to investigate that, okay? Uh, we saw earlier that we have these uh, um, stress intensity factors our stress concentration factors that we that we had looked at before and the stress can go up to infinity as the c to a ratio goes to zero okay and um so we have to we have to deal with that up to date we've pretty much treated materials like they're homogeneous isotropic crap crack free voidless, no inclusions, uh, leading to any stress risers. And that's not a bad way to do our analysis for a lot of the things, but we have to understand if we have cracks, and in reality all materials have cracks, um, then we have to figure out what to do about them. Okay, so if the zone of the yielding around the crack is small, okay, compared to the dimensions of the part, then we can use linear elastic fracture mechanics theory. Okay, this is a graduate subject uh, that we don't discuss in any undergraduate curriculums, maybe in FEA that might cover it as an elective. But um, the point is that if the zone of yielding around the crack is small, we can use the theory, and that's the theory that we're going to use to describe this. Um, all right, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about um, crack propagation and fracture mechanics, okay? So this is the the last part of the failure for the static failure criteria. Okay, this is uh, important. All right, so now consider we have a specimen here, okay, that's uh, under an axial load that has a crack in the material. And notice that this A is, is the entire, that, that's half of the crack length. Okay, students lose a lot of points every year across universities and mechanical engineering programs because they don't see that A is half. They think it's the whole width that's half for whatever reason. Okay, so most of the research is done in different modes. We have mode one, mode two, and mode three cracks. And mode one is where we have this load that's pulling the crack apart. <clears throat> and that's the one that we'll discuss here. From the theory of elasticity, we get ways of describing the uh, stress around a crack as a function of the radial distance and the angle. And we can, um, if we have plane stress for a crack, we can describe it using these equations. Okay, it's not necessary for you to know these, it's just for you to understand that there is the theory of elasticity and it's where we got them. Okay. So if you take your um, PE exam, you might see this on, on some of the questions, and you could go into your machinery's handbook and find the loading conditions and which equations to use. So um, what we want to do is we want to talk about the stress intensity of that crack, okay? Now, that is not the same thing as the stress concentration that we covered earlier in the statics. It's the stress intensity. The stress intensity factor is a calculated value based upon an assumed crack size, okay? Usually we'll use a, a sub-index like one, that means it's the mode one failure. And when the stress intensity exceeds what is called the fracture toughness, which is a material property, we get catastrophic failure. I'm going to say that again. Stress intensity is something that we calculate based upon a crack size, and then we can compare it to a fracture toughness of a specific material. If it is equal to, if, 
if K, the stress intensity, K1, not stress concentration, K1 is greater than or equal to KC, we can get catastrophic uh, failure. The crack will rip across the material. If it's less, if the value that you calculate for an assumed or measured crack is less than the uh, fractured toughness of the material, then you can have three conditions. Either that material is in stable mode, okay, so you have static loads in a non-corrosive environment, or it's in slow growth mode where you have time-varying load, so we're approaching fatigue. We'll get into that in more detail in a non-corrosive environment, or you have a fast growth mode where you're in a corrosive environment. Okay, so if you have an exposed surface, and we'll talk about this later when we talk about corrosion and, and things like that, but you have different modes, okay? So even after you get a design done, um, you have to keep these things in the back of your mind, okay? And we'll, we'll go through a little example uh, before. This just kind of shows you the effective von Mises stress uh, distribution of a ductile material around the crack due to an applied load with a certain uh, uh, crack length. Excuse me. So um, if you have uh, A, which is this A, which is half of the length, then it's much less than B, which is the distance from the center of the crack to the edge of the material, then you can use this equation here to calculate your stress intensity factor, which you can compare to the fracture toughness of the material. If your crack happens to be at the edge and your A over B ratio is less than 0.13, then you can modify with about 10% accuracy and calculate your stress intensity factor as this. Okay, so if you nick the edge of a material, then you can use this equation if you can measure the crack. Bending is different. Okay, this is not bending. There's a whole table for these values and you actually have to change it. So this is the general equation right here and you got to figure out what beta is based upon your loading conditions. This is the trivial example. This is an edge crack for a trivial example. This is the rest of real life, and you've got to get beta. And you can find beta from handbooks and tables and stuff like that, such as the machinery's handbook. Now, the fracture toughness is a material property, as I said. Okay, When you get the stress intensity, not the stress concentration, to be greater than this, and you get crack propagation. You can look at the safety factor. Safety factor is just whatever the fracture toughness is over the stress intensity that you calculate. And obviously this can change over time if your crack grows or you change environments to a corrosive environment. Um, it matters, the grain structure matters for fracture toughness and it also, fracture toughness increases at higher temperatures, okay? So fracture toughness is, is a friend of ductility. So uh, wherever ductility likes to go, if you get higher ductility, you get higher fracture toughness. Okay, so you can kind of keep those things in mind. So people have made the mistake of introducing higher strength steels, which have lower fracture toughness, and it's caused problems in the past. Okay, so you gotta be aware of fracture toughness. Okay, and fracture toughness is, uh, Orient, orientation dependent. This is just so for you to be aware of. Okay, and these are the definitions from like the ASTM standard right there. And these are some orientations where you get different grain structures if you were to cut out some test samples with known crack geometries and then test them to failure. This would, this would be how you would do it. And this comes from a mil spec document here. Okay. Uh, stress intensity factors are weird numbers. I don't really know why they are, what they are, or how they came to be this, but they are in uh, stress inches to the uh, half power, okay? And they're usually between 20 and 200 megapascal to megapascal meter squared. Sorry, it should be meter to the 0.5. I'll have to correct that slide and re-upload it. All right, so this is an example. We have this strap. This is just some structural steel. It's six meters long, 80 millimeters wide, three millimeters thick, and some bozo accidentally nicked it with a saw blade and left a 10 millimeter, um, a 10 millimeter, uh, like, 
cracking it, which we'll treat it like a crack. We know that for this material, uh, it's just a, a steel material, 540 megapascals, and it has a stress uh, intensity, I'm sorry, a stress a fracture toughness of 66 megapascal meter to the half power. Okay, so then the question is, um, are we going to be okay? Like, is it going to fail? And what would be the effect if we heat treated the part? What would it help? Okay, so we just go through the analysis. We find the nominal stress, okay, and we make sure that um, we're not going to fail. Okay, that's the first thing you do. And then you go over here and you get you calculate your crack uh, length, your A over B ratio. Because this is an edge crack, we're going to use this equation, right, where K is 1.12 times the nominal stress times the square root of pi times A, where it's half the crack length. So we're allowed to use this, and then we find out that uh, it we have this value, so we can compare this value to um, the... Uh, fracture toughness for that material and we find that we're we're okay we have 1.33 but if that material experienced about a 33 percent overload for whatever reason then it would just rip right across <coughs> somebody could get hurt okay so uh, the fracture fracture mechanics is um, it's a big deal um, and it's something that uh, we have to pay attention to so this is just the example from your book Uh, when were these concepts figured out? Um, within the last 50 years. Um, all right, so let's um, wrap this up. So uh, here's a summary of static loading theory. So, so far, okay, we have been able to relate a combined state of stress to an effective stress. Okay, so we did that with the von Mises. It gives us an effective stress. Uh, and we can, did this with the modified Moore to give us um, an effective um, stress or using the uh, Dowling indexes to give us uh, an effective stress that we can compare to uh, uh, failure theory and get a safety factor. Okay, um, we have uh, stress concentrations due to geometries, okay? Uh, we also have stress intensities due to the presence of cracks. Okay, if we have stress concentrations, we need to use those before calculating the effective stress. So we basically have to multiply them and then use them in our failure criteria. If you have cracks, and all materials have cracks, okay, most of them are small, so they, they um, are below the fracture toughness. Okay, but if you do have cracks or a material has been compromised, you need to be aware of it and make arrangements to fix it or weld it up or whatever you need to do. Uh, we'll talk more about this later, but the temperature and the moisture will certainly affect the service life. And we've just covered summary of the static loading materials, but it turns out that almost 90% of failures are due to fatigue. And that is the topic that we'll consider next. And we haven't considered creep. Okay. So, are there any questions? So, I owe you guys a write up for the um, presentations. Uh, don't worry about it don't overthink of it just put your heads together and come up with your best design and try to consider everything as possible and then throw you know 15 minutes worth of slides together I don't expect everybody to present I don't expect you to be dressed up I just really want to know where your team is and I want you to see where five four other teams are in their progress and I'm going to pick you guys at random so you won't know who I'm going to pick you'll find out when we log on um, and so, uh, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, um, if there's no more questions, then I will uh, talk to you guys later. And I uh, hope you have a uh, wonderful rest of your day.
And uh, just shoot me an email if you have any other questions. And I'll fix the link for my uh, scheduling the office hours.